morning for what's left of the morning, right? <clears throat> Back to uh, John chapter 6 this morning. Um, today's August uh, 29th, right? August 29th, John chapter 6. John has, uh, I think chapter 6 that rather has 70 verses in it, and I tended to do. Um, exactly half of that, 35 verses this morning, and then and then the uh, the last half next week, which is uh, mostly the red letters. But the first part of the chapter has the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000 and then walking out of the water, crossing the lake, and then it just gets into uh, the section, the discussion on Jesus being the bread of life. So um, we've already prayed, but we'll pray again. Father, thank you for, Lord, the hearing of your word and that your word is life and truth to us. Father, it is food for our soul. Lord, and bread for us, we thank you that there's no ending to it, that there's eternal life, that there's no ending to the life that comes to us through your word, even as there's no, no limit, there's no it, it's an infinite source of, of life, even as we're in your presence, to hear your voice. We expect nothing less, Lord, but to hear from your voice and to feed from you today. Lord, thank you for that. And we can expect that as we sit at your feet today, Jesus. So strengthen us today and all those that are with us here and um, those that are watching remotely. Father, put your blessing on them and on their life. Enlighten our minds cause us to think, to understand, and to see, Lord, uh, with a renewed mind and a transformed mind by your Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, chapter 6, um, let's see, who wants to read those first uh, 15 verses? I have a couple people read here. John? John? Okay. And um, Joe, you can read the uh, you can read chapters uh, verses sixteen to twenty four. How about we do that? Okay. Um, chapter six, beginning in verse one. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him because he saw his signs which he performed on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up on a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was near. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing the great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him. For he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? Then Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number, about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples to those sitting down, and likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. So when they were filled, he said to his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, so that nothing is lost. Therefore they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, This is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, there, go ahead, I'm sorry. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come make him king by force, withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. 
I know it was dark and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing and the water was growing rough. When they had rolled three or three and a half miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I, don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat <coughs> reached the shore where they were, they were heading. The next day, the crowd that had stayed at the opposite shore of the lake realized that only one boat had been, been there, and that Jesus had not entered it with, with his disciples. But they had gone away alone, and some boats from Bert's Landed near the near the place where the people had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got in their boats and went to Capernaum to in search of Jesus. Okay. Now there's uh, two different stories here. Both of them involve a miracle. This is one of the sections here. In fact, um, it's a good example of why we need a good study Bible and why we're using the NIV study Bible um, on this, not just because of translation, but the notes involved on it uh, bring in a lot, a lot of the what we have in our uh, book from Merrill Tenney. John, the Gospel of Belief, is, is in um, uh, the bottom notes. If you don't have a, an NIV study Bible, especially uh, uh, really any of them are going to have the, the notes, but, but if you can, get one of the original ones from before, before the newer revisions of the NIV, with the original NIV 1984 study Bible. I just picked up two copies in paperback actually last week from um, online from thriftbooks.com for only like $7 or something like that. But if you don't have one, um, do get it. For example, on this, on this page, on the story we just did, right at, the, right at the bottom, there's a map of the Sea of Galilee in northern, um, the northern country of Israel, but not the region of Galilee. So you see how the towns are situated and how they went this side of the lake over there. You see where Tiberius is on the left, the south left side or west side of the Sea of Galilee. Capernaum is at the north end of the Sea of Galilee, north and just a little bit west. Bethsaida is, due, is directly at the tip, the northern tip of the Sea of Galilee at the mouth of, uh, of uh, a creek that runs down from Mount Hermon to the north and feeds the Sea of Galilee. From where they were, Jesus had made his um, his second home in Capernaum, which was the place where he called Peter and his brother Andrew and James and John, the sons of Zebedee, and the fishermen. They they were they were uh, natives of Capernaum, so he made that his outpost whenever he wasn't in Jerusalem, and that's where they did most of their ministry from Capernaum. Even though Jesus grew up as a kid in Nazareth, which you see on this on this um, map is halfway between the Sea of Galilee and the Mediterranean Sea. It's halfway inland. And so Nazareth is straight in the middle of, of the, what you call the region of Galilee to the north. But um, so here, after some time, um, the beginning of chapter 6 in the story, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias. So they went from probably the Capernaum area and crossed the Sea of Galilee to the other side, which would put them on the east coast of the Sea of Galilee. What do we call the what do we call the, the area of land on the east of the Sea of Galilee? To the west of it, between the Galilee and the Mediterranean Sea, you have the region of Galilee, which was where the northern ten tribes were, right? And Nazareth and that. What about east of the Sea of Galilee? What's that, what's that region? 
nowadays or um well nowadays it's now the golden heights nowadays or? Well, yeah, it's it's Syria, Syria yeah. to, to the nation of Syria today. In Old Testament times, what was it? Who resided there? Before they they got that they got everything everything east of the Jordan River. They took before they crossed the Jordan River and before Joshua led them across the Jordan River. But so before that, two and a half tribes took. Took the east side of the Jordan River, Manasseh, yeah. half tribe of Manasseh, and uh, Ephraim. No, well, actually there was uh, no Ephraim was. Uh, Judah. Um, and you have you got you had to look at the map in the back. That's what we have to study by. But so anyway, um, uh, yeah, two and a half tribes over there. And then, but in the time of Jesus in the New Testament, what did they call that? What did they call the Transjordan? Gad, Reuben, and the half tribe of Manasseh was on was east of the Jordan. Reuben was actually on on the east side of the Dead Sea. Gad was on the east side of the Jordan River, between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. Manasseh was on the east side of the of the um, Sea of Galilee. You can see that in the, if you have a map in the back of the Bible. So, so um, Reuben basically took Moab, Gad took Ammon, and uh, half tribe of Manasseh took the land of the Aram the Aram Aramaeans up to almost Damascus. But anyway, that's just. Um, in the time of Jesus, now long after the ten tribes of the north were carried away captive 700 years earlier into Assyria, and Assyria destroyed it, defeated it. Then in the time of the New Testament and the Gospel, when the Gospels were written, what did they call this? The Decapolis. The Decapolis, which in Greek means ten cities. So there are ten cities. So that when you say Jesus went into the region of the Decapolis, and that's where he um, he met this man with, with demons, and he, he cast out this this man with, in the demons with uh, uh, and I, I think the story about the pigs going uh, over the cliff. Um, so he goes over to this is where this one starts. He goes over to they cross the lake over to the east side of the Sea of Galilee. So now they're on the east side in, in the, what you would call the Decapolis, the area of the tents. And it's just, um, why is it important? Because well, later on at the end of the story, you're saying they're, they're looking for Jesus. He disappeared, what happened to him? So uh, then he, he crosses over the, and the, how they get from this side of the lake back to the other side of the lake, how did he get there? They all knew he didn't get on the boat with the, with the 12. When after the crowd had left, there was, and by the way, this is also significant, it was no small crowd. By the way, this is the only story in all four Gospels that is repeated by all four Gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, outside of the resurrection. Hmm. Outside of the resurrection, the feeding of the 5,000 is the only miracle or sign that is recorded by all four Gospel writers. So that's significant, and it it leads it leads us to his Jesus discourse and his his revealing himself to the disciples and to the world as the bread of life, the bread of life. You know, like he himself is the one that if you consume him and take him into yourself, you will have a life that never ends, that you'll never hunger again. So this is important. And what's on the other side of the Jordan River? Look at the, if you, yeah, this is what's nice about having the study Bible. Nothing. There's no cities. You got Bethsaida, Chorazin, and Capernaum on the north. You got Magdala, Mary, Mary Magdalene, and Tiberias on the east coast of the Sea of Galilee. On the west coast, there's nothing there. Um, as far as cities, you have to go much farther inland. 
uh, it's a grassy area, but for some reason there was no town. So, it, what's what's why is that significant? How big was the crowd? Yeah, five thousand. That's a kind of a big. Area. Five thousand what? Just men and men. Yeah. Do you think the men were there without the women and children? It's five thousand men, not including women. And typically, in any group, men and women are somewhere about fifty-fifty. Yeah, maybe sixty forty at the most, one to the other, but usually it's fifty fifty. So you can double the what what the number that was for men, and then these days there's two point one children per family. <laughs> so <laughs> so if there's ten thousand adults there, and there's two point one children, there's probably twenty, about twenty thousand, maybe more, because. They didn't have birth control back then. And two was a small family. So there's probably more like between at least conservatively 20 to 30,000 human beings on the east coast of the, of the Sea of Galilee where there's no towns. So these folks came there on purpose to see and hear Jesus because they had heard of the signs and the miracles that were surrounding him. They followed him. Twenty to thirty thousand people. That's a good size foot. That's an average major league baseball game. Yeah. Well, not anymore. It's been, since since uh, it's fallen on hard times. But it used to be. It used to be uh, a football, a major league football or or baseball with that with a stadium is is uh, uh, near seventy five percent capacity. It's going to be you know, 30,000 people or more. That's a lot of people to go by foot into an area just to see somebody preach. It was more than a day's journey because the day was getting on towards the evening and if these people didn't get on the way, they weren't gonna get home before dark and they were gonna be hungry because they had, they'd been in a place where there wasn't any place close, in, a town close enough where they could buy food in a market to feed themselves, much less a crowd of that size. So he makes it, uh, um, Jesus asks him the question, not because, as John says, not because he needed an answer, but he wanted he wanted them to, the, the wheels to start turning in their head, what, what's happening here? And what the, so he asked him, where are we gonna get enough bread for these people to eat? He didn't ask this, to, he just had, he knew what he was gonna do already, he just asked this, only to test them, John says. So um, here's this here's this great crowd, twenty to thirty thousand, in a remote place along the sea. It's a lush place because there's grass there. He makes it a point to say there's grass there. Unlike once you get south of the Sea of Galilee into the Judean, it's mostly desert, rock, sand, and hard dirt where nothing grows. Only up from the Sea of Galilee and northward. Is, is it lush enough to grow anything, especially on, on the ground, where anything's going to grow by itself that's not planted on purpose, and then you put fertile dirt there on purpose, and then you water it on purpose, because at least there's a, there's a stream there, and there's a lake there, and there's a source of water up there. It's the only place where you're going to get green. Um, when you go to Israel and you're there in person, you can see that. It's green there. Everything south of the Sea of Galilee is brown and orange and beige sand, you know, um, and it's dry. But here, on that side of the Sea of Galilee, there was grass, and it allowed them, that many people, to be able to sit comfortably on the ground without, you know, with some cushion there, without. Um, you know, how long, how long are you going to be able to sit on a rocky surface and not have to get up? You know, but they sat there for, for hours to hear Jesus minister and to receive from him. We need this. We need that. We're suffering this. Our child is suffering that. It came not only for answers, but when you come for a need to be met, you are coming for answers bigger than that. Why? Because life is more than just health. I always, hear, I always hear secular people say this, and religious people even, growing up in, uh, you know, a re 
religious uh, setting. If you've got your health, you've got everything. No. There's a lot of healthy people that are going to hell and they're, and they're going there. It seems like the more healthier you are, the more chance you have to do whatever you want and not think that there's any consequences for it. So, you know, you, you don't have everything just if you have your health. It's a blessing. But sometimes God uses um, the lack of health to get people's attention that there's something greater here for your existence and why you're here in the first place. There's something greater that you're missing and that you need. And if you get that right first, then, the, then God is more than willing. And yes, he's compassionate and he wants to heal. And he, he, he's not a fan of suffering. He's not a fan of physical pain and suffering. But he allows it for the greater good because it's oftentimes the last resort to, for us. We, but our fault, we use it. We, we use it as the last resort to finally turn us to God. Where else can you go? Doctors, I can't help you with this. Where else are you going to go? Time to call out to God. You know? And oftentimes it takes a terminal diagnosis for people to finally start thinking um, that there's more to me than just 60 or 70 or 80 years on this short life on this planet. Right? But anyway, um, so he asks Philip, and Philip answers, eight months' wages wouldn't be enough to buy bread for each one that has a, to have one bite. Um, the NIV and other translations would translate that into modern-day currency. And just, they just always say, eight months' wages. What's eight months' wages today? Let's say you're probably going to start to think somewhere probably around at least $30,000, you know? If an average salary is somewhere around 45 to 60 anymore, I don't know what it is because I'm so far into the poverty level of part-time part salaries. But, <laughs> but uh, it, uh, I think if you look it up, what's the average salary? And then figure about two-thirds of that, eight months wages, probably around $30,000. Um, to feed 30,000 around people, that's about a dollar a person. Would you say wouldn't give enough money? Where are we going to get thirty grand anyway? So, in, out in this wilderness, and um, so no, we can't. Even if a we don't, there isn't enough money to feed this people. We don't have it. B there isn't a town within walking distance to go and buy that much food for this many people. Even if we had the money, there isn't a town close enough where we could purchase that much food for this. Philip, why did you, and this is um, also in the notes, you'll get this in the footnotes, I'm praising the NIV study Bible here. I got it. Most, of the, most of the food for the, for the class today right out of the notes here in the study Bible. Philip, of all people, answered this question because Philip was a resident of Bethsaida, which was the nearest town to where this happened. He's the one that was asked. He, he was a native of Bethsaida which is right up at the tip of the northern Sea of Galilee. So he would have known. Ain't no market anywhere near us big enough where we're going to buy that much food. So it's cool to have the little details here and to understand the little details. And it brings the story a little bit more to life, to reality, what is going on here. So um, one, of, one of the other disciples, verse 8, Andrew, Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a little boy that has five small barley loaves and two small fish. I like it how one of, it's one of the disciples that wants to help. He's trying to be um, bring an answer to this. What can we do with this? Here's what we do have. We're, we're willing to use what we do have. But what's that going to feed? Two people? You know. Um, and by the way, he makes the point that it's five small barley loaves. Okay? Small as in... Um, not a large loaf that would feed a family. If you were going to, you know, one was going to cook at home and make enough bread to feed her whole family, you'd probably make it in one loaf and then it could be sliced and broken up for all to eat. Uh, but when you're traveling and you're going on the road all day and you know you're going to be gone all day, let's say if you're going to go camping or something or going to go on a picnic and, you know, 
Dodge Park or something. You're going to you're going to just carry enough that you're going to eat that meal that day or what you can carry in your picnic basket, right? You'll be bare. So a small loaf would be a child-sized loaf of bread just to carry just enough for one person for one meal. You can expect small loaf enough just for that kid to carry for him to eat that day or to eat while he was on the walk, on the journey that day. Five. Maybe that's going to feed five people one uh, once. Okay? The Gospel writers take the time to tell us the details of what they had. That's the point. The point is pay attention to details because the details tell us and explain to us, hey, this was a real legitimate miraculous event that took place. Let me tell you about the story and I'm giving you all the details of what happened here so you know that something supernatural happened here and that this Jesus has the power of God Almighty himself to create things out of thin air. And this is exactly what happened here. Now remember all four gospel writers record this story. And then two small fish. Again, not just not a 20-pound salmon that would have fed the family, but a fish that might have been a, a, a dish for a child's portion. Uh, two of those and two small individual-sized loaves. So Jesus says, have all the people sit down. All 20 to 30,000 people sit down. Um, read in Mark's Gospel. Mark gives us a couple more details. He had them sit down in groups of 50s and 100s and sat down. And then he blesses the bread and breaks it. And he gives it to the disciples to distribute to them. Um, John doesn't tell us that part. You get that in Mark's recording of this. And they're sitting down. And he did the same also with the fish. But he started with the bread. And he blesses the bread and he breaks the, the, the bread. The fish are really, we would probably, we probably put the meat in the center of the dish and, that, that's what, and then the vegetables are just surrounding it, right? For them, the bread was the staple and the fish was um, incidental. Um, maybe it was because it was more abundant. Um, but the bread had to be made. You had to take grain. It, it took something to knead it, to put it together to bake it, and it came from the ground that God had blessed. And it has some significance to the flesh of Jesus. As he said, this, this bread is my body, right? So he did that. He blessed it. He distributed it through the disciples. He gave it to the disciples and had them distribute it. And then... Um, did the same with the fish. When they got enough, when they had done everything and, and they had fed all of these uh, tens of thousands of people, they had enough to, they, everybody had enough to eat and leftovers. What was cool about that is they were able to take something, you know, pack, stuff their pockets and take some home for the ride home. So they would not only have left full, but they would left to have provisions for home. And maybe when they got home, they'd have something to put in the fridge. <laughs> or the ice box or whatever they had, wherever they kept things fresh. Right? Because there were tw after it was all done, there were 12 baskets full. 12 baskets full. He also makes sure that we knew how many baskets full there were left. And it, typically a basket full would have fed a family. Now we started off with five small individual sized uh, loaves of bread that would feed one person or one probably one small person or child. Five of those. Now we've got 12 baskets full of the broken pieces left over, which had to be, you know, we're talking about more than 10 or 20 times more leftovers than what you had original with the meal itself. Okay, all you have to do is do the math, if you can just figure um, that. And Jesus says, no, I didn't make all this stuff so that we can throw the pieces away. 
let nothing be wasted. Let no piece be left behind. <laughs> so they gathered and they filled 12 baskets full of pieces of loaf. And after the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. The prophet. What was he referring to there? Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 18. And there's, again, you'll see that in the and that he's studying what was what was what was that prophecy and who is the that referring to? It's gonna be the Messiah, I believe, wasn't it? The Messiah. And what what was being promised in Deuteronomy 18? That he would be uh, a prophet would come who would be just like Moses, and what did Moses do? He delivered the people from bondage in Egypt out of there with great power and great sign, defeated the world, I don't care how big, strong, powerful, and if the, the devil has the entire world system on his side, it ain't nothing when God shows up and he, when he sends a deliverer. And Moses was just a, a man with a lot of flaws and hang-ups and had to be convinced to even lead the people. He was in, he didn't have no confidence in himself. And God used a, a, a nobody to humble the greatest nation and the greatest power on earth at that time, Egypt and Pharaoh of Egypt. Through those ten power plagues, delivered him out of Egypt brought him into the promised land that God had promised them 400 years earlier through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But in between, between the bondage and between the promised land, there's this desert for 40 years, which he led them. And that point, place, and time, and the wilderness, and the desert. Then, what did the prophet Moses do? Moses was called the prophet. By the way, prophet, by definition, is one who speaks for God to men. He gives God's word to men. Hears from God, is in God's presence, hears God's word, and delivers that to men. Moses did that because he came from God and met God in the wilderness. And God said to him, this is my word to them. Let my people go. And he gave God's word with authority to Pharaoh. Later on, he gave God's words as he received it on Mount Sinai. And that's how we get the first five books of the Bible, the Torah or the Pentateuch. And in that, the law that had to do with how they would approach God through the sacrificial system and the tabernacle and all that that entailed so that they would see by, these, by this physical representation that God is covenanting with man through blood, a blood of a covenant, that he would always be with them and they would be his people and he would be their God as they recognized this covenant they had together. He gave God's word to them through that covenant. There's another prophet who's going to come who will give God's word to men the way Moses did, but that would end the need for all other prophets because he is the word of God. He does just bring the word of God. He brings the word of God by bringing himself. He is the word made flesh that dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Remember what when they're in the wilderness and Moses has got 2.3 million people in the wilderness and there is nothing there but dry sand. Nothing to grow and no rain from the heaven and they're looking at nothing but what would have been 40 to 50 days of travel by foot where are we going to eat and feed 2.3 million people are, besides our cattle and our sheep? And what? And so they look to Moses, not with, not with hope and expectation, but with complaining and anger and wanting to go back. And he calls out unto God, and God feeds them in the wilderness bread heaven, dropping down from heaven with the dew in the morning. And they called that bread what? Manna. 
manna, which means what is it? What is it? <laughs> mana, mana is the, literally in the Hebrew. What, what, what is that? And that's what it stuck with. First thing that came out of their mouth, that's what stuck with the name of it. And it was like, what did they say, coriander seed or something that was baked in the, in the oven. And it mostly tasted good. They used it and had a sweetness to it and a pungent to it. So it had some taste to it. And it fed them. Moses gave them bread from heaven. God gave his bread of life to man from heaven. And so that's important. After the people saw the sign of all of these tens of thousands of people, verse um, 14, is this the prophet who is to come into the world? They all said, these thousands. Is he the one who is going to do what Moses did? They saw somebody who fed tens of thousands before their eyes and Moses fed the millions in the wilderness by the hand of God who rained it down from heaven. And here he was, the word of life given to that. He ends that, that story. After the story of the walking on the water, crossing the sea, we'll have to get to that next week. He gets, and he speaks to them. And when they finally catch up to him back now on the Capernaum side, he says, why, why, were you all, why were you all frantically trying to find me and seek me over here? I'll answer it for you because you didn't come here because of the food and the miracle. You came here uh, not because you saw the miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and you had your fill. Do not work for the food that spoils but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. On him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. And he's about to say that and divulge the fact that I am the bread that gives life to the world. Eat of me and you'll live. Same thing that happened to the, I will have to end with this and we'll pray, but I want you to see the connection and the parallel between this and the woman at the well, where she was thirsty and he was thirsty, and they started with the need to have water. And then he begins to say, if you drink from me, I will give you this water that you'll never thirst again. And here he is with tens of thousands of people uh, talking about the bread that comes from heaven. And if you will eat of me and consume me, and then you will make me the source of your life, you will never hunger again. He starts out with that the same thing. With one, it was an individual, a, a Gentile, a half Gentile. And here's the crowd. Food and life come from the source of life, if you will if you'll go to him for that. We'll have to pick this up. I always, I hate to, we only had about 35 minutes today. Um, but we've got a number of folks who are ill today. Um, and we'll pray for them, the Napoleons and others. Um, we've got about seven people that we know of that have been diagnosed with COVID this week. Um, and the net, and uh, so we miss a lot of folks. Father, we're thankful to you today, and we're thankful for your word that you've given to us, and that you are the word that gives us life, that gives life to us in the world that came into the world. May we be able to hang on that, trust in that, trust in that you're the one that gives us life. Help us to walk in you, Lord, to obey in you, to obey you, and to walk in the faith that you provide to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. A faith that comes through hearing the word of Christ. We pray that you cause what comes out of us to be a blessing and life-giving to each other as we fellowship together and as we worship your name today. May we hunger for more of you, more than life itself, all through every day of the week, not just on Sunday. And that we'll see more of you and seek with expectation and hope to see you face to face where we'll be made complete in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.